Good morning, everybody. Still a few people dripping in, but um, let's all stand. We're going to begin our time of worship now, so we're going to start off with a real upbeat song, House of the Lord. So let's uh, plenty of singing, plenty of dancing. Oh, 
worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
Lord, we gather this morning in awe and gratitude for what we, you have done in our lives. Lord, you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are our firm foundation. Where would we go? Who would we turn to but you, Lord? We just acknowledge you this morning that you are worthy of all our praise. We love you, Jesus. Amen. And while we're still standing this morning, I don't know about you, but um, I know, Ben, we had a time of worship at the beginning of our service last week for the situation in the Middle East and uh, still remembering what's going on in Ukraine as well. And I just felt this morning that um, here we are a week on and things just uh, don't seem to have changed at all. So it's a good opportunity to pray together corporately and just spend a minute or so as we stand here and just cry out to God, I think, for his intervention in this situation. Um, We pray for those who are trying to work in the diplomatic arena and work out aid to get through. We pray for those on the ground who are doctors and nurses and the medics trying to bring um, healing to those who've been injured. We lift up the aid workers on the ground. We think of those who have been displaced and are now homeless, for the hungry, for those who are traumatized, and for those who seem to have lost hope. So, Father, we just just spend a minute now just offering up your own prayers, Lord, that he would hear the cry of our hearts. Father, we thank you that you hear our prayers. We thank you that you're a God of compassion. You're a God of mercy. Bring peace, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to take a seat now. And uh, welcome to you this morning. If you're joining us online, welcome to you if you are here for the first time. Welcome if you are visiting us in this island for half time, you are very welcome. If you are um, new to church, and uh, there's quite a few of us here, so it can be difficult to get to know people, we would really encourage you to go and have a chat to somebody who's on the information desk, and they can tell you all the ways in which you can get to know people and get involved in what's going on here. Or you could just probably turn to somebody next to you and uh, ask them as well. So, um, welcome. Anyway, right, uh, before we um, get, go on to some notices, just a little bit of housekeeping, really. Um, for those of you with children, just wonder if you could avoid uh, bringing chocolate as their little snacks that they have during worship time. Um, we have some really lovely, nice gold chairs here, and uh, we just want to keep those as nice as possible for as long as uh, possible. So uh, if you could avoid chocolate, we would really appreciate it. And um, what we're going to be doing uh, probably from next Sunday is there's going to be a little handheld hoover behind the tech booth there. And so sometimes we look, we know that it looks like somebody's had a picnic on the floor in worship. So if, if you have left a bit of a mess, if you wouldn't mind just going behind the tech booth, getting the little hand hoover and just having a little tidy up. We would really, really appreciate that. So anyway, that's housekeeping done. Um, We had a great time this week at the Alpha Grow evening that was on Wednesday. We had uh, Sophie and Matthew come over from the UK who are part of um, 
Alpha Central there and just share some really encouraging testimonies and stories about what's going on in Alpha. So um, watch this space with regard to Alpha. We're looking forward to launching our Alpha course in January and um, there'll be lots more information about that coming out over the coming weeks. And if you don't know what Alpha is, it's an opportunity, it's a 10-week course with an opportunity to ask any question you like about the Christian faith. And we really do mean any question. So, uh, yeah. Um, so coming up, we have the 10th, 11th November. It's quite a busy weekend. We have a team coming over. There's going to be about 15 um, YWAMers coming over, team from YWAM, which stands for Youth with a Mission, and they're going to be working with our young people and our adults, along with St. Paul's. We're going to be hosting them as well. You may have had an email about that this week. Um, if you can host somebody for that weekend, please again go to the information desk, and uh, that's going to be uh, there's going to be teaching, there's going to be worship, and uh, it's going to be a really great uh, weekend full of events for our young people and our adults. That's 10th, 11th November. And also, it's going to be a busy weekend because we have our final Inspire uh, event of the year that's going to be happening on that Saturday morning, the 11th. So don't forget to sign up for that. And then just this Wednesday as well, we've got our prayer meeting, uh, our intercessory prayer meeting, where we meet in the foyer out there for an hour, six till seven, where we can just pray what's going on internationally, nationally, locally and um, as well what's going in our own congregation so that's a really um, good time when we just have an hour pressing in together um, in prayer right I think that's all our notices and if I've forgotten anything I will uh, tag that on to the end later but it is time for our children and our young people to go out so um, young people I think you're going to meet in the foyer before you head across to the premier inn and uh, children, again, if you're signed up, head straight upstairs. And if you're not, go and sign up at one of the tables. And for everybody else, if you'd just like to uh, say hello to somebody near you and uh, see how their week's been. And we'll be back in a minute.
If you'd like to take a seat and bring your conversations to an end. Uh, one thing, I did forget to introduce myself earlier, so sorry about that. If you don't know me, my name is Kirsty, and uh, I'm one, Morning Eddie, and I'm on uh, staff here at Freedom. Um, well, we have, a, for the observant of you, you may have noticed that we have a slightly larger screen than we normally do this morning, and that's because our preacher's going to come to you on screen this morning. Um, we're a little disappointed because Andrew was due to preach for us this morning, but came down with COVID uh, this week. But he has managed to prepare, and uh, thanks to the wonders of modern technology and gifted family members, thank you, Micah, he has uh, been able to record that, and so we are able to have Andrew's talk um, here this morning. He is going to be talking on perseverance, and it is week four of our Firm Foundation series, and uh, the last in our series. It's been a great series, I think you'll uh, agree with me there, and we've had some really wonderful and encouraging and inspiring talks given to us. Um, so I'm going to hand over to the tech team who are going to play Andrew's talk to us on Perseverance, so enjoy. Hi church, so wish I could be with you in the room today, but I hope that the heart of what I want to share comes through and that you are tangibly encouraged today and tomorrow and the days that will mark the rest of your lives. So, prior to the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, John Stephen Akwadi of Tanzania was just another marathon runner. An Olympic caliber runner, yes. He'd won marathons in Africa, running with times under two and a half hours. He easily qualified for the Olympics, but in Mexico City, Aguari encountered an obstacle he had never faced before, the altitude, which caused his legs to cramp severely. Still, he kept running. Then about halfway through the race, he tangled with some other runners and fell. He dislocated his knee, scraped his leg and hurt his shoulder as he fell. But he didn't stop. With terrible injuries and cramped muscles slowing him, he laboured on and finished the race. He was one of 75 people who started the race and the last of 57 to finish it. When he finally entered the arena for the final lap, only a couple of thousand people were there to see him complete the race. He finished dead last, more than an hour behind the winner. A cheer went up for this brave runner as he circled the now darkened stadium. Although it seemed that Aquari had lost the race, everyone who saw him finish knew he was a winner. 
Now, you can only imagine how many times after his fall must Aguari have thought of giving up. Why bother? Everyone else is finished. I've let my country down. I'm in agony. No one expects me to finish now. And in an interview later on, a reporter asked, Why didn't you quit when you were hurt and bruised, bloody and discouraged? Why didn't you quit? And this was his response. My country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. That one sentence sums up the essence of a life following Jesus. Jesus didn't die and be raised to life so that we might start following him. No, he died and rose again that we might start following him following him and finish our race. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this last series called Firm Foundations. We had Ben kick it off with humility, then Henry on resilience, and last week, John speaking on faith. And today, closing out this series, we're going to take a little bit of time to talk about perseverance. The Oxford Dictionary defines it this way. The quality of continuing to try to achieve a particular aim despite difficulties. Let's face it, starting well, no matter what it is, is relatively easy. Finishing well is a different matter. Starting that new diet or exercise program is kind of fun, but hanging in over the long haul is the real test. Getting married is exciting and full of promise. Staying married through the struggles, adjustments and trials is not always an easy matter and requires perseverance. Now, someone who knows about struggles is Paul, the apostle writer of most of the New Testament. In 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8, he says this. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, does Paul say, but also to all who have, belo- who have longed for his appearing. Do you hear that, church? That promise is not only Paul's, but also you who can hear my voice today. Paul is talking about perseverance day in, day out, following Jesus, no matter where that may lead, no matter what valley we might find ourselves in. A tenacity to keep going, to push through, to never let go. (laughs) He's one who talks from experience. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says a few of the things that he had to persevere through. He was imprisoned repeatedly. He was flogged. He was exposed to death again and again. He received 39 lashes five times. He was beaten with rods three times. He was pelted with stones. He was shipwrecked three times. He says, I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in dangers from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea and in danger from false believers. I have laboured and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been Cold and naked, besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak, says Paul. Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn. When Paul is encouraging us to persevere, he is talking as a practitioner. So I want to encourage you today That the same Jesus who saved Paul is the same Jesus who saves today. 
the Holy Spirit that lived in Paul, that encouraged him, that enabled him to persevere, is the same Holy Spirit that lived in us when we have given our lives to Christ. And that same Holy Spirit will help us persevere in in all of our situations, in all of our encounters, in all of our struggles. Paul embodies what it means to persevere in the faith. His letters in the New Testament tell us his story and are crucial as an example and encouragement of perseverance. Again, the writer to the Hebrews says in chapter 12, verses 1 to 4, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And I love the way the New Living Translation translates verse 2. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. I want to ask you, church, in all the struggles that you are facing, are you encouraged that Jesus is your champion? He is the one who initiates and perfects your faith on your journey. And he is the one who will bring you to completion if you continue to persevere. You see, it's easy to worship God when things are going great in your life. When he's provided foods, food, friends, family, health and happy situations. But life is simply not always fun. It is often incredibly difficult. In fact, Jesus reminds us that in this world we will have troubles. But take heart, he says, for I have overcome the world. The deepest level of worship is praising God in spite of pain. Thanking God during a trial. Trusting him when tempted surrendering while suffering and loving and trusting him when he seems distant. In our relationship with God, we will not always feel close to him. In fact, the psalmist put, put, paints an incredible picture of this distant God at times. In Psalm 13, he says, O oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle, struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O Lord my God. Restore the sparkle to my eyes or I will die. Don't let my enemies gloat saying, we have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. But, the psalmist says, but I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. Can you sense the anguish, the hurt, the disappointment, the longing? Are they not consistent with how often we feel? Where we feel God is distant and not answering and not coming through? Look at the intensity of the language. He says, I try and try and still nothing. Four times he cries out, how long, Lord? But he continues to persevere. I'm not sure this longing will resonate with people here right now. You see, when you open your Bible and it looks like black, black ink on white paper, but doesn't say or mean anything to you. When you close your eyes or pray, but you can't concentrate for more than two or three seconds 
and you feel like you're simply wasting your time, what do you do? How do you reconnect that intimacy with God? What does the psalmist do? He doesn't stay thinking about the situation he finds himself in. He doesn't let the situation interpret God's love for him. No, he focuses on the reality of God and allows that to be the focus of his attention. He recalls that which he knows to be true. He says, but I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. I know that in the room this morning, I know that in every home that can hear my voice, there is a myriad of challenges. Some of you are in valleys. Some of you are te are terrified of the situation you find yourself in. Some of you are anxious. There are pressures in every area of life. And you may be thinking of giving up. You may be wondering if it's all worthwhile. It doesn't feel like you've had a breakthrough for weeks, months, maybe some of you even years. Now, I can't convince you to hold on today, but I can encourage you to hold on. You see, I know that there is more in you than you know. I know that the Jesus that I know and that Paul knew is not finished with you, no matter how distant you may feel he is, if you will hold on. I know that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. You see, this is not meant to be a pet talk or a half-time team talk to inspire you, but this is meant as an encouragement to keep going, to keep believing, to keep getting up, knowing that whilst you have breath in your lungs, Jesus is not finished with you and that your race is not yet run. You need to know that God is more for you than you are for yourself. But are you choosing him? Is the focus of each day still on the wrestles, the disappointments, the frustrations, the hurt, or on God and who he is? That is the essence and the strength of what we need when we persevere. He never said it would be easy. You see, we want patience, etc. But we don't like it when we're faced with situations that require us to be patient. We like the notion of the fruit of the spirit, but we want it dumped on our laps rather than it being developed in us. And perseverance is one of those gifts that is developed in us over time. And it takes situation after situation after situation to develop perseverance in us. The value of courage, persistence and perseverance has rarely been illustrated more convincingly than in the life story of this man. At 22, he failed in business. At 23, he ran for legisl legislature and was defeated. At 24, again, he failed in business. At 25, he was elected to legislature. At 26, his sweetheart died. At 27, he suffered a nervous breakdown. At 29, he was defeated for speaker. At 31, he was defeated for elector. At 34, he was defeated when he ran for Congress. At 37, he was elected for Congress. Then at age 39, he was defeated for Congress. At age 46, he was defeated for the Senate. At age 47, he was defeated as he ran for vice president. And at 49, he was defeated again for Senate. Then in 1951, he was elected president of the United States. That's the record of Abraham Lincoln. The man who died April 15, 1865, has consistently been ranked by historians and the American people as their greatest president. He did not allow all the previous defeats and disappointments to determine his outcome. He persevered year in, year out through various disappointments, one knockback, one setback after another, yet he continued to hold fast. Church, 
The Christian life is best compared to that of a marathon race. It's a long race, a hard race, and you can guarantee that it will be and is full of challenges. But our call is to persevere, to overcome, not by sheer willpower, but keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says this, and he uses the analogy of a runner. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? So you run in such a way as to get the prize. I don't just turn up, train, be prepared, give it everything. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training, he says. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly, he says. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strive. I blow, I blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. It's one thing to enter a marathon, but it's another thing to finish that race. And we finish it with per perseverance, with dogged determination, just keep on keeping on. And there are many people who jump on the Jesus bandwagon, but never finish the race. Church, do not let that be, be you. I want to encourage you to keep getting up. There are many people who walk down church aisles, who confess their faith in Christ, who are baptized into Christ, but eventually drop out of the race for some reason or another. In marathon running, it's called hitting the wall. And that's when the runner basically runs out of gas and life is full of hitting the wall. Experiences of death, divorce, sickness, loss of a loved one, shattered dreams or just the pressures of everyday living. Our jobs, raising children, finance, mortgage, job uncertainty, political instability, wars and rumours of wars, wanting to be liked and all the rest of it. If you feel like you've hit that marathon wall and are, and are on the floor crawling, I want to invite the saints. I want to call upon the church right now to applaud you, to champion you, to offer you words of hope and not despair, to encourage you to keep going, to keep believing, to keep hoping, to keep doing the right thing, to take another step, to get up again and again and again, that to, re to remind you that tomorrow is another day, to assure you that the Lord himself is waiting for you at the finish line. And you will not quit. Do not think that if you are on the floor crawling, that if you think you are down and out, that you are beat. No, if you're the only words you can mutter are help, then I want to encourage you that that is more than enough, that the Lord still sees your perseverance. Many marathon runners and long distance runners know what it means to hit the wall. One minute they're running with incredible energy and speed and the next they feel incredible tiredness and sickness and no energy and have to stop or maybe even drop out of the race. Now, researchers have discovered that the brain starts to dip in dopamine at certain points in the race and there is a literal dip in motivation, excitement and drive to continue. In order to comp combat this dip, many athletes have implemented the spectator strategy where they position friends and family members at specific mile markers to help encourage them and cheer them on. Instead of hearing, I can't do it, I can't do it in their head, they hear, you can do it from their fans. Hearing the cheers of encouragement counteracts the dopamine dip and lifts the athlete's spirit, pushing them forward with more vigour than before. Think of that as I read Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles 
and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Church, there is a cloud of witnesses around you, people who want to stand by you, who want to encourage you not to give up. Now, you'll remember Thomas Edison, the man who invented the light bulb. It has been said that Edison tried anywhere between 2,000 to 10,000 combinations before he could make it work. In one of his writings, Edison states, Our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try just one more time. Church, can you hear the encouragement of the saints? Can you simply trust the Lord and take him at his word that he will never leave you or forsake you, no matter what situation you might be going through right now? Keep getting up. Try again. Hold on. Do not let go. If all you can muster is to say help, then you have a faith that is persevering. And I want to encourage you. Look around the room this morning. Look around at your brothers and sisters and encourage them. Give them a, give them a round of applause. Give them a slap on the back. Go and say, well done. Go and ask them if they're doing okay. I love this little section from the diary of John Wesley, the 1700s preacher. On Sunday morning, May the 5th, he preached in St. Anne's and was asked not to come back anymore. On Sunday afternoon, May the 5th, he preached in St. John's and Deacon said, get out and stay out. On Sunday morning, May the 12th, he preached in St. Jude's. Can't go back there either, he writes. On Sunday morning, May the 19th, he preached in somebody else's deacons called special meeting and said he couldn't return. On Sunday evening, May the 19th, he preached on street, kicked off the streets. Sunday morning, May 26th, preached in a meadow, chased out of meadow as bull was turned loose during the service. Sunday morning, June 2nd, preached out at the edge of town, kicked off the highway. Sunday afternoon, June the 2nd, afternoon preaching a pasture. 10,000 people came out to hear me. John Wesley, he never gave up. He kept persevering. Just as fine wine takes years to mature and gold is refined through fire, maturity as a believer is not based upon how many home groups you've been to or how many scriptures you can quote but how are you holding on to him are you trusting and are you persevering because one day the race will be over and Jesus will say well done my good and faithful servant see it takes years to grow a sturdy oak tree in fact a tree requires wind and the beating of the rain to make it strong. In 2 Peter 1, 5-7, it said, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. We need to determine some truths about God, church, as I come to a close. God will not fail. He is the beginning and the end. He is for you. Make sure you know what your anchor is made of. He's never going to let you down. He'll never let go. Understand this, that the storm in your life may rage for a week, for a month, for a year, for a decade, for a lifetime. But here's the thing. You come to him when he is yours and you are his, he ain't ever going to let you go. We need to understand what an anchor does. In the storms, when a ship is being anchored, in the, in the waves tossing that ship about, the anchor is doing its job when no one can see what it's doing. So I'm praying for you this morning. I'm fighting for you this morning. I'm advocating for you this morning, church, that no matter what is going on in your world, 
I want you to know that God is still working beyond what you can see or what you can feel. But will you hold on? I'm calling you to persevere, even if none of it makes sense. While you trust, will you trust your outcome to Jesus? James 1 verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial after they will receive the crown of life God has promised. And I close with this story. In the 1880s, a Welsh missionary who had endured severe persecution finally saw his first converts in a particularly brutal village in the Indian province of Assam. A husband and wife with their two young boys professed faith in Christ and were baptised. Their village, deci- their village leaders decided to make an example out of the husband. Arresting the family, they demanded that the father renounce Christ or see his wife and children murdered. When he refused, his two children were executed by archers. Given another chance to recant, the man again refused and his wife was similarly struck down. Still refusing to recant, the man followed his family into glory as they shot him down with arrows too. Witnesses later told the story to the Welsh missionary. The report said that when asked to recant or see his children murdered, the man said, I have decided to follow Jesus and there is no turning back. After seeing his children killed, he reportedly said, The world can be behind me, but the cross is still before me. And after seeing his wife pierced by the arrows, he said, Though no one here to go with me, still I will follow Jesus. Have you decided, church? Have you decided to follow Jesus? to persevere, to hold on, that no matter what you are going through, know that he has the words of eternal life. Know that he is the one who will bring you the breakthrough. Knowing that he is the one who applauds you as you cross the finish line. Knowing that he is the one who will accomplish in you what he has begun. He loved you yesterday. He loves you today. He loves you in the middle of what you are going through and what you have been through and what you are persevering through. I want to encourage you that you are stronger than you know, because he that lives in you is is greater than all the troubles that you may be facing. Keep persevering, church. Keep holding on. Keep running your race until he says enough is enough and welcomes you home. God bless you. Have a great day. Wow. Well, thank you, Andrew. I know you'll be uh, watching this at home. Thank you for such an encouraging and inspiring uh, talk. I think uh, there's probably not somebody breathing in this room who's had to dig deep and persevere in the situation. So I'm sure that's uh, spoken to everyone here today. So thank you, Andrew. We appreciate that. And uh, we pray for you and Serena to be, uh, be back and well very soon. Let's worship. Let's all stand now, church, and uh, as Andrew said in that preach, let's sing to the Lord.
we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you are trustworthy. Lord, when we're going through difficult situations, when we need to press in, Lord, we thank you that you don't let us down. Thank you, Jesus. There's a prayer team. There's people who would love to pray for you this morning if you think you need some encouragement to keep going through a difficult situation. There are people that would love to help you by praying with you this morning. I think if you're not going through a difficult situation at the moment, but as Andrew said there, we can be the ones to pray, we can be the ones to encourage, we can be the ones to support. So we all have a, a part to play. So if something Andrew said to you this morning has spoken to you, speak to somebody, ask them to pray for you where you are, or go and ask some of the wonderful prayer team to pray with you this morning. They'd really love to do that. But don't leave here without uh, somebody standing with you. Well, that's it for this morning. Thank you, band. You've done a great job. Thank you, Andrew. That was a great word this morning. And we will see you next week. God bless.